I've called this talk, Walk as Jesus Walked, and it comes from a couple of verses that occur in 1 John chapter 2. For the first slide, I wanted a photo that would indicate walking. And as I was looking at various pictures on the web, I thought, well, maybe one with footprints on would be what I'd need. And then I came across this picture. And they say a picture paints a thousand words. And I thought this was a very interesting photo. You've got footsteps going off into the distance. Person is walking off into the distance. But in the foreground, you've got a pair of handcuffs open laying on the ground. To me, this speaks of somebody who was a prisoner, who was captive, who was bound, but now they're free. And they're free to walk off into the distance, unrestricted, unbound. Handcuffs always speak of being captured, being restricted, being restrained. And they always speak of a loss of liberty. And yet here, the person is free of the shackles. Often it's associated with somebody who has done what is wrong. They're, they've been caught by the police, they've been handcuffed. And yet here the picture is of somebody who's free of these handcuffs. He's free to walk off into the distance. And I just thought this is a tremendous picture of what happens to us when the Lord frees us from the many situations and circumstances that we, we can find ourselves in in life. These situations can be many things. It can be poverty, it can be anxiety, stress. It can be the challenges of relationships. It can be dissatisfaction with life. It can be frustration. And yet the Lord wants to set us free from these things. To reinforce what the Lord wants to do for us. We have his words from John eight thirty six, Where Jesus says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Whatever we find ourselves to be captive to, to be a prisoner to, whatever loss of liberty we find ourselves in, wherever we find a loss of freedom to be the people that the Lord wants us to be, then we have these reassuring words of our Lord. If I set you free, then you will be free indeed. So, walk as Jesus walked. As I say, the talk comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And every now and then, when I read the Word of God, sometimes there are passages which just seem to hit you between the eyes and really make you stop and think. And this was one of those passages. John writes... This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk as Jesus walked. I've used the EHV version of the Bible, which is the evangelical heritage version, and mainly because it uses the phrase that I wanted, walk as Jesus walked. Obviously, John isn't talking about literal walking. He's not talking about putting one step in front of the other and going from A to B. The idiom here of walking is to do with the way you live. And we'll look at the NIV version of this verse next. But I liked this concept of walking as Jesus walked. If you walk somewhere, then it implies purpose, direction, reason. And 
to me that's what Jesus had as he lived his life. He had purpose, he had a reason, he had motive, he had direction. He knew where he was going and he knew what he was doing. And the exhortation here by John in his letter is that we should walk as Jesus walked. And we think about that for a minute. That's quite an amazing statement, really, that the way Jesus walked, the way he lived his life, is exactly the same way that we should walk and live our life. And we should walk as Jesus walked. The NIV version of this passage says, This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. This is how we know we are in him. And the him there is Jesus Christ. If we claim to be in Christ, we claim to live in him then John says we must live as Jesus did. Note it's not, it's not a request, it's not a... He might be able to live in him. It's possible to live slightly the way Jesus did. The exhortation by John is whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So often as Christians we tend to put Jesus in a class of his own that it's possible for us to live slightly the way he lived. It's possible to do some of what he did. And yet John here says that we must live in exactly the same way as Jesus did. And so the question really is, well, John says this, why is it possible for a Christian to live in exactly the same way as Jesus did? Is it possible? Is it something that can happen? John's obviously not lying, but I think in our own minds we'll probably say, well, Jesus was in a class of his own. And I can't possibly ever do or say or be the same way that he was. And that's just impossible. Well, let's look at New Testament verses that might help us to understand that this claim is not an impossible claim. If we see how our lives have changed because of what the Lord has done for us, then perhaps we can get a greater handle on walking as Jesus walked or living as he did. The first thing I want to look at is this concept and it's a very real New Testament, New Covenant concept, concept of Christ in me. And I want to look at several verses that talk about this. In fact, if you did your own Bible study on this, you would find there's actually quite a few verses that talk about Christ being in us. Paul writes in Colossians 1.27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice the statement here highlighted in red. Christ in you. We can say as Christians that Christ is in me. In Galatians 2.20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And once again, see the phrase in red, Christ lives in me. And in another of Paul's letters to Corinthians 13, verse 5, he writes, Examine yourselves 
to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realise that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And again, the highlighted section there. Do you not realise that Christ Jesus is in you? So there's at least three passages, and there are many more, that talk about Christ Jesus being in us. If we now construct a diagram of what this statement Christ in me looks like, we have the outer circle, which is me, and we have the inner circle, which is Christ. So we're the container for Christ. Christ is in me. Christ is in the centre of me. I contain Christ. But interestingly, there are also verses that talk about me being in Christ. And so let's have a look at those verses. In Romans 8.1, we read, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, notice a highlighted phrase, in Christ Jesus. Previously, we've looked at Christ being in us. But now, Paul talks about us being in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. Again, this talks about us being in Christ Jesus. Me, I'm in Christ Jesus. And finally, 2 Corinthians 5.17, a well-known verse to us who are Christians. Paul writes this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. But notice a statement. If anyone is in Christ, the person who is in Christ is a new creation. And praise God, the old has gone and the new is here. Let's now put this new statement, me in Christ, into a diagram. And here, Christ is the outside circle and me is the inner circle. Christ is the container and I am at the centre of Christ. So the bottom line is, if we take both diagrams, Christ in me and me in Christ, we have a bit of a dilemma because it's impossible for both statements to be true at the same time. If in the first diagram, I'm the container and Christ is in me, then the opposite, me being in Christ, cannot be correct either. And yet, Paul in, and we've looked at six verses, says both statements are true. Well, as far as I can make out, the only way that you can rationalise out what appear to be two opposite contradictory statements is by this diagram. Christ and me are so now intertwined, so fused together, that actually it's completely impossible to distinguish Christ and me. This is an amazing statement. It's something which is extremely difficult perhaps to get your mind round because it sort of makes you think, well, Christ is me and I am Christ. And yet, no matter how difficult that statement may be to take on board, I think it's the only way that you can reconcile out statements of Christ being in me and statements of me being in Christ. If we look at what the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23, then this also 
indicates that there is no separation now between Christ and his body, the church, between Christ and me. There is so much a, a fusion that it's impossible to separate the two out. And God placed all things under his feet, that's Christ's feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Christians of the church, the body of Christ. But notice that very last statement, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And to get a handle on what is quite a difficult statement, it's worth looking at the Passion Translation of verse 23. And now we, his church, are his body on the earth, and that which fills him who is being filled by it. Now, okay, this might still leave you thinking, well, I'm not quite sure what that means. But actually, I like the footnote that the Passion Translation also puts in for this verse. The footnote reads, that is, as we are those who are filled, completed by Christ, we also complete, fill him. What a wonderful and humbling mystery is revealed by this verse. Notice that in brackets is the word completed. And that's because the Greek word that is translated filled can also be translated completed. It's your choice as to which you use, but it can actually mean both of those words in English. And so that's why in this footnote, in the Passion Translation talks about those who are filled, or in brackets, completed by Christ. This concept of Christ filling us and completing us is an idea that most Christians will take on board quite readily and easily. However, to think that we complete him and fill him might be more challenging to accept. However, based on the verses we've looked at so far, that talk about Christ in me and me in Christ, then Surely it's not too much of a stretch to agree with what the Passion Translation says here in the footnote that he fills and completes us and we complete and fill him. Going back to where we started in this talk and returning to 1 John chapter 2, the second part of verse 5 and then into verse 6, and let's remind ourselves what that says in the EHV version of the Bible. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk as Jesus walked. And here, John is categorically stating that the one who says he is in Christ remains in him. Then they should walk exactly the same way as Jesus walked. John elsewhere in his first letter, in chapter 4, verse 17, says, This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. This again is just backing up the statement that there is no separation between us and Christ. In this world... We are like Jesus. The same disciple who wrote 1 John 1 and 1 John 4 also writes in his gospel and he recalls the words of Jesus in John 14 verse 12. And here Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do 
the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. A very powerful statement that reinforces what we've been looking at, that we can walk as Jesus walked, we can live as Jesus lived. Because here Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. From this particular verse and what Jesus said, I understand that what he did, I am able to do. And amazingly, Jesus says that I'll be able to do even greater things than those that he did. I think for the time being, I'll content myself with trying to do what he did and uh, let the greater things <laughs> worry about themselves in the future. But notice what Jesus says here, the reason that we can do the things that he did. And that's because he's going to the Father. He has now gone to the Father. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And I believe that because he's now in heaven, the works that he did and that now expects us to do are to be done by us because we're the ones who are on the earth now. Jesus isn't on this earth in his physical form, but we are. And I believe he's given us the responsibility of doing the things that he did in our generation, in our sphere of operation, in the circumstances we find ourselves. Jesus says, truly, truly, amen, amen, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I have gone to the Father. In John 15 verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Notice in this verse that Jesus talks about remaining in him and him remaining in us. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. So once again, we have this concept of us in Christ and Christ in us. Jesus says that if we do remain in him and he remains in us, then we will bear much fruit. And that is quite a challenging statement, I think, for us as Christians. And we really do have to ask ourselves, are we bearing much fruit? And then Jesus makes this statement, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's an interesting statement by Jesus where he says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. He doesn't say, apart from me, you can do a few things. Apart from me, you can do quite a lot. Jesus says that apart from him, we can actually do nothing at all. Absolutely nothing that's of any use to him, to his father, to the kingdom. We are so, so dependent on Jesus Christ. And as he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. In John 12, 23, 24, Jesus says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus makes this statement several days before his crucifixion and subsequent death. So when he talks about a kernel of wheat falling to the ground and dying, I believe he's actually talking about his own death. 
The picture he's painting is of a seed falling to the ground, dying, but as a result, it then produces a new plant, a new plant of wheat. And that ear of wheat will actually have many seeds in it. So the death of one seed actually results in many seeds. But the thing that's important to realise is that a wheat seed will only ever produce more wheat seeds. An apple seed will only produce more apple seeds. Human seed will only produce human beings. So Jesus here is saying that if he dies, he will actually produce more of himself. He will replicate himself. He is one, but when he dies, he will then produce many of himself. It's my own personal belief that we as Christians are actually Jesus' seed. In Romans 8, 20, 21, the Apostle Paul writes, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Notice that Paul says that the creation which is in bondage and in decay will be liberated and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. This is something I think that God expects us to have, the freedom and glory of the children of God. God wants us to be glorious. God wants us to be free. And he's provided the means for that to happen through his Son. So as Jesus himself says, if I set you free, you will be free indeed. So to finish, we just go back to our initial slide, which tells us to walk as Jesus walked.